Hey, everybody. Welcome to Scene to Screen, the show about the basics of screenwriting. I'm your host, Corey Reeder, writer, director, filmmaker. That's me. Each week, I gather a diverse panel of TV writers, showrunners, screenwriters, and producers currently working in the industry. We discuss the skills of, and craft of screenwriting while making sure that the conversation stays inclusive. So if you're a new writer, the show is for you. If you're a person with a disability or of color or LGBTQ, this show is for you. Or if you're just looking for something to do because you're bored in quarantine, eh, this show is for you too. So as usual, I have a fantastic partner in this whole thing. She's got fingers fast as lightning and her name is Mona Jean. She is our ASL interpreter. Hi, Mona Jean. <laughs> Good to see you. Every week, I pick some sort of silly sponsor to uh, promote this show. And uh, this week, it's Essential Workers. Yeah, these guys, you know, Essential Workers, whether they're a nurse, a doctor, a hospice worker, a postman, a delivery truck driver, a food and agricultural worker, or a grocer, a, a person at a restaurant, a server, the police officers, the firemen, the janitors, the engineers, the water and power people, they're all making our world still be livable right now. You know, every night at eight o'clock, my neighborhood lights up. People bring out drums, bubble machines, they clap, they honk their horns. We even got some crazy people that have the zoos, the the zoos, you know what I'm talking about, those loud things that they have at all the soccer tourneys. Anyway, for about five minutes, everybody makes a ton of noise and it's a blast because we want to remember at the end of every day, none of our lives would be as easy as they are, even if they're hard, if it wasn't for all these people. So thanks, essential workers. Hope you guys are having a good day. Now, let's do this. Fade in. This is it. In episode one, we talked about coming up with a good story idea. In episode two, we learned how to break down and organize those ideas into screenplay structure. Step three, last week, we talked about discovering what makes a good character and how to develop that so it drives your story. And now here we are. Time to get to work. We're gonna start hitting some keys. We're gonna start setting some scene headings, slapping some slug lines, exposing some exposition, setting up some stakes, creating some conflict, and finally facing off against that always looming foe, writer's block. Here with me today to talk about the actual work of screenwriting is a panel of amazing screenwriters and TV writers and they are also all educators from the top film schools in the US. That's right, if they're not making content for us to watch, they're teaching aspiring writers just like you the craft of screenwriting. The difference is today, you don't have to pay any expensive tuition. For the next hour, you're gonna be able to glimpse their knowledge and know-how. So let's jump into it. Our very first panelist is Michelle Amore. Michelle, come on into the room. Hi, how are you? How you doing? Good. That was such an exciting intro. I got all charged up. <laughs> all right, good. I, I try my best. All right. So, Michelle, the way this works is I'm going to put 60 seconds on a clock. Okay. And for 60 seconds, you tell us who you are, however you want. All right. Okay. Well, on your mark, get set, go. Okay, I'm Michelle Amore. I was named after the Stevie Wonder song, My Sheree Amore, except my mother didn't like the name Sheree, so she named me Michelle. Um, from Chicago, the West Side, we like to say we beat up the South Side. <laughs> Even though most shows set in Chicago are set on the South Side. Um, I became a writer um, after I left undergraduate film school because I didn't, I couldn't find any material that really spoke to me. Um, I most recently sold my first television uh, show to CBS last fall. It's called The Honorable. It's about a black woman judge in Chicago, and I was also. Uh, listed as uh, one of the top uh, educators around the globe in variety this year. I teach at LMU. I love teaching as much as I love writing. I don't have pets because I'm allergic. I love Ethiopian food. And my favorite artist of all time is Prince. And I am still sad that he is no longer on our planet. Mm. That's it. <laughs> yeah, it was perfect. And, and uh, yeah, Prince. I mean, come on, the yeah. best, yes. the best. Yeah. Okay, let me bring in our next panelist. Welcome, Michelle. Next is Maria 
Escobedo. Come on in, Maria. Hi there. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Right on. Welcome to Scene to Screen. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. Tell us all about you. You ready? I'm ready. I Here we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, born and raised in New York City. I went to film school at the School of Visual Arts. I ended up writing and directing an independent film and uh, uh, came out to LA uh, when I got into the Disney ABC television writing program. Uh, from there, I ended up working, writing on Grey's Anatomy. I wrote for Hulu's East Los High. Uh, I sold a pilot to Nick Teens and wrote a Lifetime movie and a Disney Channel movie. And uh, I also just this fall sold a one hour pilot to ABC um, which didn't get picked up, you know, but that happens. I have a lot of projects that didn't get picked up as part of the industry's, uh, you know, um, way of working. And, uh, and so I also teach at the, the screenwriting at, uh, in the writing division at USC's uh, School of Cinematic Arts. I've been there for five years. That's I got in just in time. <laughs> right on, right on. Welcome, Maria. All right, next to the floor is Paul Chitlick. Come on in, Paul. How are you doing? Hi. Great. How so, are you? I'm pretty good. Um, I'm dealing with the uh, incubation here. Ah, well, aren't we all? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's, I prefer let's to call talk it about incubation rather than quarantine. <laughs> but, uh, let's talk about something fun for the next hour, how to, how to make screenplays. But first, give me 60 seconds on Paul, all right? Sure. Born in Cleveland, uh, grew up, uh, went to high school in Long Beach, California, went to college in Berkeley, lived in uh, Madrid for a year, lived in Spain, I mean in uh, London for four years, went back to Madrid, uh, been back here in Los Angeles since 75, worked as a ESL teacher for a while, and then one day uh, a little voice inside of me said, this is not the plan, and so I decided to become a TV writer. I did not go to film school but I did uh, take a class or two at UCLA Extension. And then um, I got lucky by sending a play called Casanova Goldberg to an agent who was just about the same guy as I was writing about. So he, he said, uh, I think I can get you some work. And he got me some work. That was uh, 35 years ago. And I've, since then I've written for Twilight Zone, Who's the Boss, Amen, Perfect Strangers. Um, Alien abduction, uh, several other things I can't even remember anymore. And nice. uh, the latest one was the wedding dress. And I teach at Loyola Marymount University and I teach a wide variety of subjects. Am I close to the end? That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul. All right, last but not least, Amy Fox, come on into the room. Hi. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Um, I apologize. Well, the wall behind me, we're doing some quarantine renovating as one so, the, the, Besides the, cer the, the certain times right now, this is a perfect time to do renovations because nobody would see it except exactly. for, well, us. So, right. um, Amy, tell us about yourself in 60 seconds. Ready, set, go. Sure, I grew up in Colorado um, and I um, originally, when I left school, I wanted to be a playwright and I came to New York City and I uh, had some plays off Broadway and got involved with the writing community here. And then um, people kept kind of popping up and asking me to adapt my work for screen. Um, and so my first film was an independent film called Heights that came out in um, and then I had a film that came out in 2016 called Equity, which is about women on Wall Street. Um, I also teach uh, full time at NYU. I think some of you guys might be Dean, right? Is my, uh, she was my colleague at NYU. I think Rochelle in this holding results. Nice. nice. Good timing. Perfect. All right. Well, let me put that little gimmick down. Let's get into it. The fun and fantastic world of screenplay formatting. Luckily, 
most of the formatting formalities that I had to deal with when I went to college years ago, uh, they're now super easily handled by screenwriting software. Uh, talking about basic formatting, like the characters' names being in all caps and dialogue being centered on the page and the overall page layout. But even though software can do that, there's still plenty of formatting mistakes to be made. And that's what I would like this conversation to be about. Um, really quickly, for the new writers that are watching, on the tip of software, can we just go around the room really quick? And can you guys talk about whatever your favorite software is? Michelle, would you like to start? Well, I use Final Draft. Cool. Amy? Yeah, so I started out with a um, company called Script Bear that was local to Colorado, and uh, they unfortunately went out of business because I liked them better. But oh, no. <laughs> Paul? I, I used to like Screenwriter, which was really good, but um, it kind of fell out of use, and I use uh, Final Draft mostly. I recommend don't use Celtics. Uh, because it really, when you convert it to PDF, it really messes things up. Good tip. And Maria? Final draft. <laughs> final draft. I got to say, I use final draft too. <laughs> that being, as well, uh, that being said, there are softwares that are out there. Celtex is one of them, but as Paul said, it can have its issues. There's also another one, Highland 2, that was uh, uh, created by uh, screenwriter John August that uh, has a free version download, but um, there's a lot of other stuff and I'll put links to different software in the show notes. So with that out of the way, um, let's get into the, the details. Um, and uh, whether you're setting a scene or introducing a character, I'd like to know what's too much or what's not enough detail to include. Uh, Maria, would you like to start us off? When uh, when setting when when starting a, a scene, you mean when introducing a scene, you mean? Yeah, when you're introducing a scene and yeah. you're trying to set the vibe and the location and what the characters are like. Like yeah. some people can take an entire page filling up the. Yeah, you don't the, want to do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 tricky because um, you just have to once you write what you what you feel you need to write then you say to yourself okay am I writing a book <laughs> no I'm not so pull back on what you think that you need in there it's so it's hard for me to say three lines you know it, it, it depends on uh on what you're really setting up and the same thing for a character I mean um, for TV, I find like you have a little bit more flexibility to talk about the character and to give the character a little bit of information that for features, they sort of shy away from, you know, um, so because you're sort of the 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 um, the boss in you know the writers the boss in TV so you you are able to sort of flower it up a little bit more but still uh, less is always more. So uh, Michelle, like l with less being more, I think we've all I know I've been guilty of it, but I've definitely read these kinds of screenplays where people really love to get into alliteration and mm -hmm. treat their screenplay as if it's like a majestic novel. Um, is that the right thing to do? Well, here's the thing. I mean, you definitely want to show your writing style and what makes you very unique, but keep in mind, this is a business, right? So one page is equal to one minute, period. Like, so when you're thinking of that, you're always thinking like, how do we move the story forward? And for me, I like to say less is more, meaning if you can say it in five, don't say it in six, right? Really be as tight as possible. And also you're, we're in a business of, you know, uh, creating content that will be seen. So I like to always tell my students, show us don't just tell us, try to, especially if you, if you hide all of the description of a character, like in the, in, 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 in a non-action way, just show us how she's, you know, an asshole. Oh, excuse me. Can we, curse? I'm sorry. You know, like, Go show, ahead. we're all adults here. Okay. Right. So show us and keep that in mind. Uh, and yet you want to make sure that we want to turn the page. So if you have too much description, um, you know, sometimes that's a turnoff, to be honest. It's like, oh, this writer has like all this description, like it's crazy, unless you're writing an action sequence and you're opening up like 
like the born identity or when they all open on action, but then it's written in a way that you still want to turn the page. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Paul, uh, you mentioned before that you've worked on Twilight Zone and a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that you've done some, some action stuff or definitely some like sort of heady sort of thing. I mean, there's nothing plain and simple about a Twilight Zone episode. Right. So as, as people get into that as early writers, I imagine that they see something now like a John Wick movie and they want to write out every punch and every kick and leg sweep and every single round of the gun that's fired. Um, when, when you've been writing action moments in the past, uh, what, how is that, how does that pare down? What's, are the rules of thumb to keep things like that moving along? Are there certain things that are just implied? Well, there's a couple of ways to approach this. First of all, you have to think that you're just writing a blueprint for 150 to 1500 people to work on. So in an action film with a lot of CGI and uh, special effects and things like that, you're going to have thousands of people working on it. You just want to give them an idea what to do, but you want to give them the freedom to create stuff too. So you don't want to overwrite the description of what happens. You don't want to overwrite what a character looks like. You don't want to overwrite what the actions are. You just want to give this everybody an idea of what it's going to look like and an idea of what's going to happen and then let them do their jobs. So you don't have to describe what everybody's wearing in a college classroom. You just have to, have to say a classroom full of college students and they're wearing their normal clothes and let them figure that out. Let the costumer figure that out, the wardrobe person. You don't have to describe everything in the classroom or everything in the office. Like in my office, you don't have to describe every book, uh, every mirror, every typewriter that's in there. Just say it's an office of an eclectic writer and let the person that is their job do that job. Same thing for cinematography, same thing for uh, stunts. You don't have to write out every stunt in a fight. You can just say that they fight and it's a, it's a fight that rolls from one side of the room to the other or uh, there's a kick and there's a punch and just be very brief in it and let the stunt coordinator work it out. So let okay. the people that are the professionals do their jobs. Great. So Amy, there are certain things though that are, that are character traits that, you know, if, if that might need to, to be specifically pointed out. Someone's wearing a specific blouse or has a, a particular watch or a piece of jewelry, something that will be important later. Um, is it better to try and introduce that stuff early or does it, is it just supposed to happen? Like what, how, how should things that are important, if we wanna keep the pages turning, if we wanna keep things moving, how do we know when the right time is to introduce key elements? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what I try to do is when I introduce a character or a setting for the first time, I try to just grab a couple of really vivid words. Um, you know, so like like Paul said, you know, you wouldn't describe everything in the office, but I might say something like, he has a globe on his desk and a like burnt out candle, just some tiny thing that says how that guy's office might be different from a different character's office, right? Because that gives you a picture. Um, if there was a watch that later on becomes important, I would not put that in my introduction to the character because you, when, when I'm writing, I'm very focused on kind of what the, the reader can take in um, and also what an audience eventually can take in. Um, but first my script has to be read. So I would say just before that watch becomes critical, I would put in a, a state, an action line, maybe another character notices the bulky watch on his wrist, right? Or he, the character himself glances down and, and fiddles with his watch, something that suddenly calls our attention to that right before it's going to be important. Got it, great, okay. So let's let's get into some character stuff. Uh, one of them is, is, is names and character names, which might seem like an innocuous thing. You know, I can pick names of, of characters that like, oh, you know, this kind of reminds me of my friend, Sean, so I'm gonna, call this character Sean. Um, but I've also read plenty of scripts that have problems with names. So like Maria, for example, I'm writing a psychological thriller and the three main characters are named Connie, Chris, and Christina. Is that all right? 
never. <laughs> yeah, it's too difficult to, you know, for somebody to follow, really. So uh, pick the one that you're really in love with and then change the others. That would be my uh, uh, suggestion. So Strongly is there... I suggested. Yeah. Are there, are there uh, rules of thumbs? Are, are certain names better than others? Um, I mean, that's kind of hard to say because, um, you know, it, you don't want to say that, that name for, you know, four letter names are easier, even though they may be, but, you know, you don't want to say that because culturally there's so many different names that you don't want to limit people and, you know, you know, have every Latina be named Sonia, you know, mm. <laughs> because it's, yeah. you know. So I, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, say that. All right, cool. Um, while we're talking about characters and character names, uh, this panel is, is fantastically suited for something because uh, Maria, Paul, and Michelle all sit on committees or boards within the WGA. Um, and I think that you would be able to help the audience uh, with, if, if we're trying to create characters, if we want to write things that um, are more inclusive, um, what is the best way to either be introducing these characters um, of different ethnicities, of, of different uh, abilities or disabilities uh, within screenplays? How far do we go down that rabbit hole? Can it be uh, as simple as saying, uh, you know, Hector, 26, Latino? Uh, should there be more things to that as we go into it? And, and where does the tone of the introduction and things like that, what is, what is the right way to approach those things? Michelle? Um, okay. So I'm also the co-chair for the Committee of Black Writers at the Writers Guild of America West. And so this is a common kind of question that I think I get also as a professor. One of the things I always ask the students, for example, is why? If you're not the race of the character, I wanna know, first of all, why you're choosing to tell your story through this character, especially if it's the protagonist. And sometimes what I'm hearing is students are saying, oh, well, they're saying you gotta be diverse. I wanna be diverse. And I'm saying, wait a minute, what? Like, that's not the reason why. So let's start there. I think that when you're coming from a place of uh, genuine, like you wanna tell a story, you know, you find a person or a character interesting, you really have to make sure that you're uh, I think your intentions, first of all, are pure. And let me just say that because a lot of times when people write outside of their race, specifically non-people of color, writing people of color, they often do miss a lot of nuances and they miss to me something very important and it's really simple. I call it love. It's just a love for the people sometimes. So they get caught up in like the world. Like I had a student who wanted to tell a story about a poor black boy growing up in poverty, but he was this rich white kid from Connecticut. And I said, well, why do you want to tell that story specifically? And it was only because he felt that he needed to do something diverse. And he wasn't come from a like he wasn't coming from this place that he really wanted to tell this particular kid's story. So I'm big on, first of all, finding out why, and then ultimately making sure if you do tell the story, do your work, do your research. When I was starting out, I remember writing gay characters and I based them on my two gay friends, right? So they were always really funny because those two guys are funny. And one of my gay friends in Hollywood said, we're not all funny. <laughs> right, and he goes, you, you know, some of us are, you know, real uptight or serious and he really challenged me and I appreciated that because then I started to look at my, you know, characters that were LGBT and, and say, okay, let me not make them all like my two friends. <laughs> That's what I mean by doing the work. So we can do the work. We just have to be willing to get out of our comfort zone and listen when people tell us that maybe what we're doing is falling into like a stereotype, so. Okay, so, so Maria, What if, if I do want to be inclusive with race, if I want to include like uh, Latinx characters in my writing, but obviously I am not Latinx um, and I, I'm trying to be caring about it. I do research. Um, is there, is there I, I, I don't mean for this question to be redundant. I just want to be thorough in asking like uh, uh, what's, what's, What's a way to be able to do that and, and make sure that I'm being caring, I guess. What, what are places where I can go to do the research? 
Well, I mean, I think there's two things. I mean, the, the, the example that, um, that Michelle gave is more of somebody who wants to do a story about a, a, a kid, you know, an African-American kid, you know, and, and really just, just, to, just to sort of show that, that world somehow, right? To shine a light on that world. That's, that's different than saying, I want to have characters in my script that represent uh, our country, <laughs> you know? So, so, so to say that, you know, that I'm doing a, a show, I, I'm writing a show about a school and in the school, the uh, teachers are diverse. Now you don't have to, you know, now you're not really telling a story about, you know, a poor black kid or a poor Latino kid, right? You're just telling stories about a school that a, a, a workplace that, that normally would have diverse characters. So like, I remember somebody said to me, well, now the way things are and the way everybody complains, I can't even have, a, a, a Latino janitor, because then it's like, you know, I'm being, you know, discriminating or whatever. And I'm like, I think you can have a Latino janitor, but how about the vice principal can also be Latino? Like, then you balance it. I'm not saying there aren't Latino janitors out there. I'm just saying that we're everywhere too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good point, good point. Um, and uh, Paul, like, so you're, you're on a disabilities committee with the WGA. Right. Um, and there's got to be some circumstances around disabilities that uh, have its own sort of caveats? Well, there are. Uh, first of all, we have to understand that um, probably one fourth to one or one fifth to one fourth of the population of this country has a disability. And if they don't, they're going to at some time in their life uh, experience a disability. So one of the problems in television is we haven't seen those people on the screen. So the idea is there are two ways to write about people with disabilities. One is to write about a person with a disability and the challenges that person faces. Uh, it's probably not a good idea to do that unless you really have researched that person or that disability, or you are a person with that disability. The other way to write about people with disabilities is just to put them in the story and not mention the disability unless it's really part of the, the character. Uh, for example, you just write, the secretary is in a wheelchair or uh, somebody else is uh, obviously um, blind, but they're doing something that a normal person, I should say, shouldn't say normal, it would do something a person that's not blind would normally do. Uh, a person that's deaf, well, they can carry on a normal conversation with people that aren't deaf as well. And they can talk and they can move the, the use of sign language or they can do all kinds of things to communicate with people and in a normal position in life. For example, you can have a barista that's deaf and just not mention it that they're deaf. They just see people that go to that uh, Starbucks, for example, every day know that that barista is deaf and they know how to, to get the sign for the particular drink that they want. And the barista knows how to make the, the drink and give it to that person. And we can just see that is a part of normal life. So normalizing disability as much as possible is a good idea. And including people with disabilities, even in the background would be a good idea. That is to say uh, extras with a disability so that it's not a comment, it's just a part of ordinary life to incorporate people with disabilities as a part of normal life. Which I think echoes wonderfully what Michelle and Maria said that it's like, if you come from a place of love and you're just putting the character that's in there, in there, that's what matters. It's, mm -hmm. if, it's when you start to craft them into tropes or stereotypes um, that it can become troublesome. Exactly. Amy, um, so a lot of times when people describe characters, uh, a lot of times it'll say, uh, you know, Mary, comma, 16, comma, you know, white Instagram influencer, what, whatever. You just try to give like a little sort of tidbit so we can get really quick who, the, who Mary is. Mm -hmm. um, I've been reading a lot of articles on open casting and uh, 
just trying to say like, hey, this is maybe you use sort of a, an androgynous name or something, because it doesn't matter if it's a guy or a girl. You really want to, as a writer, sort of employ as much openness for the script as possible. Um, are, I, what are some good ways to do that? Or could that sometimes maybe backfire? Or is it always good to leave those options in there? Because you're trying to think ahead to, to selling the script. What's What's a good headspace to be in for those choices? I think it's a really interesting time as far as I can tell, because I follow, I try to follow this conversation closely and I think it's changing and there isn't like a, a rule at the moment and um, everyone else can feel free to jump in and correct me. But I actually, every time I research this, I, I find different answers about how specific to be. Um, I, what I tend to do now, I mean, there are stories where gender or race or whatever is key to the dynamics, right? I made a movie about women on Wall Street. It really needed to be clear who was a woman and who was a man in those scenes because there was a lot of sexism and different gender oh, anything neutral and like every role something that anybody could do. Um, what I like to do now, and I don't know if this is industry standard or not, but I'll just put a note at the beginning of the script that will basically say, it will give a context for my choices. So it might say, you know, the casting, the casting of these roles is completely open, um, but, I, but I would like to see a diverse range of um, ethnicities and body types. You know, I might say that. And then from that point on, I don't have to specify. Or I might put a note that says like, for this particular story, the racial makeup of the characters is really key. And so I'm specifying it where it needs to be specified. I just try to put in something so that I don't, I don't feel like every time I introduce a character, I wanna launch a whole debate on this topic. So I try to put in something that helps people just read on knowing what my intentions are. Can, can I jump in? I wanna say, I just love that you also said body types. Thank you. Cause I feel like when we talk about diversity, we forget that part as well. And it's really refreshing when I see different shapes, sizes of people. Um, it, when you think about like the rapper Lizzo, she's considered like radical for simply being comfortable in her own skin. So I'm glad you mentioned that because I've been aware of that lately and making sure that I state it. Sometimes I'll just state it because I'm like, I want this character to be full figured um, because it, it matters to me. And it, even with um, the idea of where, um, you know, full, like, um, like Paul just said, full figure, just because I want to see a full figure character in a in a role, right? It's like, like, and not have it be about them being full figure, not having them be like, oh, I have to die it. You know what I'm saying? But just full figure. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad that was brought up. Um, I so that Mike, because I was having internet problems. <laughs> okay. That's cool. Yeah, the wall has changed. It's a whole <laughs> new decor. Yeah. Um, I just want to throw out there really quick while we have the panel here, if you're watching live on YouTube, you have the ability to leave questions for our panel in the comments section of the video. Go ahead and throw up any questions you would have about screenwriting formatting in the in the comment section and we'll get to those in about the next 15 minutes and answer your guys's questions. Um, so with that, um, I would like to move on to the next part, which really moves the story along, which is bad dialogue. What makes dialogue bad? Why? Who? How? Paul? Wow, big question. <laughs> um, well, first of all, let's talk about what makes good dialogue. Uh, good dialogue is dialogue that fits that particular person. That sounds like it could only come out of that person's mouth. That doesn't sound stilted. Uh, that is not long. Uh, usually good dialogue is short, quick, uh, specific to that particular, that particular, oh, I'm sorry, that particular person's character, uh, education, background, um, where they grew up, how old they are, all the things that make up a character uh, also form that person's dialogue. So the dialogue of a five-year-old is different from a dialogue from an 85-year-old. The dialogue from a teenager from the Bronx is different from a dialogue uh, of a teenager from Hawaii. So you have to know who that character is to know what the dialogue is. Bad dialogue comes out when you don't know who the character is. Simple as that. Let me, so uh, having a character and having their voice, and Michelle, you kind of touched on this before, but I've read scripts where you have characters with varying ethnicities 
and people try to write the ethnic lingo into the script. And sometimes I get it, like I've written a script and I had someone saying like, that's fire. I don't ever say that's fire, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm of the generation that says like, man, that's cool. <laughs> but, uh, but I want, it's a 16 year old kid. So a 16 year old kid says that's fire. So um, how is that navigated? Well, for me, um, I'm very fortunate that I have a 16 year old kid. So I'll be honest, I go and I knock on his door and I say, son, tell me, how would you say this? And he'll tell me, and I have a daughter and she's in her early twenties and I'll do the same thing because you're right. It's a different voice. Um, but you, you raise a good point and, and Paul did as well. It's about the character. And so one of the things I have a tendency to write characters based on real people, uh, Keenan and I have Keenan Ivory Wands uh, was at a festival a couple of years ago. It was the Austin Film Festival. And he said, most people don't recognize themselves and every character he's ever created was someone real. And from that, I've been really thinking about when you use a real character. So when I create a, let's say if I create a 16 year old boy, nine times out of 10 is gonna be my son. So I just take the way he talks and he's a little arrogant, you know, he has a little flip mouth sometimes like a lot of teenagers, um, but he's, and he's also, he, we're from Chicago originally, but he's a Cali boy now. So he's like, I'm a Cali boy. Um, so I hear you. And I think that's the key. It's, it's listening to the character speak to you because they really will if you give them the space and you're very comfortable with who they are. So um, yeah, that to me is really fun just because whenever I think of a character, for example, inspired by my mother, I already know how, how she's going to speak. So that helps so, a lot. I don't just make it up out of thin air. Well, I, I guess I was talking a bit more to towards, towards like actual ethnic inflection. Like if I was gonna oh. write a young Latino, so let's, let's go to Maria. Like if I'm writing a young Latino character and I have him walk up to uh, a friend of his in school and he says, what's up essay? Um, is it better to, write that or is it better to put a note sort of like amy was talking about before like if the if there's fresher lingo that the kids these days are using or anybody that's more specific let the actors come up with that on set i feel like that's a you don't want to open up a can of worms where you have people improving your story yeah i mean that's really tricky i think it has a lot to do with uh, with with knowing your character, with researching your character, because um, and maybe you have somebody who you know a friend that you know who is Latino, and then say, hey, can you read the script for me? Can we like even read it out loud together? Can you you know? And and so that's part of research. That's part of of getting the the voice right. Because like you just said, you know, hey, what's up, essay? Well, if he's um, if he's if he's Caribbean, he ain't gonna say that. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> Latinos come in different, uh, you know. Different I was about to say, again, I was gonna, can I just jump in? I had a student, he he was Latino and he was, he would never say that, right? It just depends on how you, like you said, where are you from, how you were raised, your experiences. And so, you know, I had a student, uh, for example, a white student, she started off a script and she, she started off a script with a Mexican character saying, I caramba, car caramba. Mm -hmm. And um, a, a Mexican student was upset and she's like, I find it offensive. And we had a conversation. And I think that's what's important. What Maria is saying is that ultimately you have to listen to the people that you're writing if you are not them and make sure that you're, if you're, I mean, you can write whatever you want, but you have to also accept the feedback when people say, hey, maybe that's not cool. That's not okay. And there was an actor who recently just did a, um, I forget the actor, but he just, he's African-American and he talked about reading scripts that he knew that the, the dialogue was written slang for black. But again, what does that mean? That's what I'm saying. Mm. It's like, so you can't assume there, like there are 40 million black people in America. We don't all talk. But even slang. Los Angeles slang is gonna be different from New York slang. Exactly, exactly. And like I said, my son is a true Cali boy. He's just black, do you understand? Like he skateboards yeah. and he's like, he kind of has that 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 LA thing that irks me. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! And that Hungarian thing now. Too. I have a sixteen-year-old oh, yeah. version. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and he went to Budapest with me for four months. So you're right, Paul. Oh, <laughs> uh, all right. So, oh, uh, there's so that, those are all good points on uh, dialogue, bad dialogue, and good dialogue. Uh, Amy, I know you're also a playwright, right? Yes. So what about within a screenplay? I think 
everybody's uh, accepting of this and can enjoy it in a theatrical or a, a, a playhouse situation. But what about the monologue within a screenplay, the page and a half of <laughs> one character, whether it's the, the villain <laughs> laying out his entire plan to be foiled, or if it's just somebody like going off for three pages. So generally speaking, uh, you, you don't put, you don't use a lot of monologues at all in screenwriting. Um, partially, it's because of the question of like, unless it's voiceover, which does have its own role, but it's like, what is the camera doing? And the camera is not going to sit on one person's face while they're talking for a length of time. So that could work in a theatrical context, but there's things that don't make a long speech cinematic unless you are also intercutting images and specifying how you might do that. Um, there are circumstances where someone would give a speech and it might be a politician or it might be a teacher. Um, so I don't want to ban it altogether. I have my two movies that have been made. Um, I've been told by both my, by uh, Glenn Close in one case and Anna Gunn in the other case that the reason they signed on to the movie was a monologue that was in the first 10 pages for their character. <laughs> It was not more than I would say half a page, um, but the, you know, I I like speeches. I like people that care. Those are those were both larger than life characters that had a reason to kind of get up. They weren't just hanging out with their friends. One was teaching a class, and the other one was addressing a conference. Um, so it was natural, um, and I really enjoyed the rhythm of that. But it, but generally speaking, those scripts had that one monologue. They didn't have monologues like every five pages or anything. So you, you said something, thank you for that. And, and you said something in there where you were talking about as your, if someone does have a, an important uh, amount of dialogue, let's say page, page and a half, that there should be some sort of inner uh, interstitial moments where you're, you're helping describe what's going on. So it's just not dialogue, um, which leads me to people that like to play cinematographer or director on the page as the screenwriter. Um, it's often debated. Sometimes we see it in scripts by huge screenwriters that are successful. But um, is it the right thing to do for new screenwriters? Paul? Well, there's, you can say just right off the bat that it's not the right thing, but it is the right thing if you're a, a writer and you want them to focus on something very specific. So there's a way to do that that doesn't look like you're giving camera direction. So the way to do that would be like, if you want somebody to focus on the watch, like Amy was mentioning earlier, you would just say in capital letters on its own line, uh, the watch, and then go to another line in description, uh, is now reading 1205. So we've moved the, the focus to the watch without saying that we have to give a close up on the watch. We can do the same thing for a character when we're in a group scene and a, and a bunch of characters are talking, and then suddenly we want to focus on Michelle. We'll just say, uh, everybody's talking out loud or uh, the, the fight is taking place in the corner, but then Michelle, and we move Michelle onto her own line, and then we describe what Michelle is doing. So we've moved, we've directed the reader without putting the director on the page. What about more specific things like camera dollies in on Captain oh, Kirk? Get that, entirely. Forget that entirely. <laughs> That's the director's job. Like I said earlier, let the people that are making the movie do the things that they do best and let the camera dolly person and, and, and the cinematographer and the director figure out that dolly, that move in or that slider or that move out or that push in and push out at the same time. Let them all work that out because it, you're... Your job is to create the blueprint, not to build the whole goddamn building. <laughs> good point. Good point. To that, so that those are those are camera notes. We had a, we talked a little bit about this last week um, in our character development one because not only was everybody screenwriters in that panel, but they were also actors. So I want to ask you guys as educators about the parenthetical, that magic little space underneath the character name and the dialogue where people will often say like. Riley or sinister or, or whatever, but it's basically meant as direction to tell the actor, do it like this. Maria? Yeah, I always tell I always tell my students, don't tell the actor how to act. 
because then you're you're assuming the actor doesn't know what they're doing and you have to tell them what to do. Um, yeah, I, I, I try to just, you know, just try to go through the script one more time and cut it all out. If you absolutely think that you need that moment, then okay. But if you find yourself in one scene telling every character, you know, how to think or how to act, it's, it's not, it's not, that's not screenwriting. I would add to that, actually. I think you're absolutely right, Maria. The only time I would do a parenthetical is when it's contrary to the dialogue. Mm -hmm. So if the dialogue is, is jokey and the person is, you want to have that person deliver it flat, then I would have to say flatly. But uh, that's the only time if it's contrary to the dialogue. If it's along with the dialogue, then just cut it out. Yeah. Amy. Yeah, I would just, um, I would definitely agree with that with the parentheticals. I wanted to also add to what, what Paul said earlier, because um, when I'm teaching at NYU, I'm usually teaching directors who are writing scripts that they are going to direct. Um, and so a lot of them, that's their case for why they have to put in their camera angles um, or their parentheticals. And it's like, you're going to need a draft that's your director's draft, where you have all those notes of like the way you want the actor to say it so you can direct them. But that is not the draft that you want people reading who are going to consider whether to make a film or not. So you can have a really clean draft for readers. You can have the messiest draft in the world with way too much information for when you are on set. That's, that's good a good point. point, because as a writer director myself, I can fall into that, but I've also figured out ways like you've talked about to say like, how can I direct the reader where I want the camera's eye to be rather than just saying like angle on watch. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I have, I actually teach uh, uh, production majors sometimes too. So production majors who are either writing their short film or they're writing a feature or whatever that be. And I, I, I come across that a lot too. Um, where they do that and then they, there are also times when when I say well this isn't clear you know and I'm trying to get the clarity out on a page and they're like yeah but I'll know what to do when you know, it'll come out when I shoot it <laughs> yeah <laughs> like well yeah. it's not on the page so it might not come out <laughs> yeah, so, can, I, um, can I add something as well yeah I was going to say um I also teach production students at LMU and it's the exact same thing but one of the things that I emphasize to them is that um, besides the great advice that both of you gave is ultimately, if you're saying you're a writer director, then you have to follow the rules of a writer too. Like you don't get to cheat it. You don't get to say, oh, I'm a writer director. So I get to just blow the rules. It's like, no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. And for example, you might be a writer director and your first gig out is staffed on a television series, right? You're writing. So you have to then come in and write. And I always try to weed out the ones that are not the serious writers. Because honestly, if you are a serious writer, then you're going to take the notes of writers that tell you, take all this camera stuff out right now. We don't need it. And like you said, you can always add it in later. I don't let them get away with it because I wouldn't allow, I wouldn't teach my screenwriting students to do it that way. So I'm not gonna give them a pass, period. Because again, you tell me you're a writer director, then that means you're gonna do twice the work, right? You're gonna give me both. So it's like double major as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Right. Okay, so we're going to start running short on time and a couple of you guys have hard outs at four o'clock. So I'm going to burn through this last, I got one last question. I'm skipping a few, but the last question is you've made it through. Whew, first draft is done. You've typed fade out. It's <laughs> awesome. So you think that's it. You send it off to Sundance. You want them to pick it up. You send it to the Academy so you can get your nickel scholarship. That's it, right? That's yeah. Yeah. Now you just cash your check. Yeah. <laughs> what could be easier? Amy, what ha what really happens when you finish the first draft? Uh, for me, um, first thing I do is just put it away because <laughs> I need perspective on it and I won't have any perspective when I've just written it. So sometimes I don't even show it to anyone until I, I mean, unless I'm under, if I'm under a deadline, then that's a little different because I don't have the luxury, but if I have the luxury to put it away for a few weeks, that's what I do. And then I come back and read it through myself because I'll catch things before I even ask someone else to read it. I'll catch a whole lot of things that I'm not happy with. Um, and then for me, it's a process where I sort of give it to a, 
very small circle of readers that I trust initially. And then kind of with each draft, I sort of expand my circle to the point that more people are reading it and people that don't know me as well and are not automatic supporters of mine are reading it so that I can start to get really honest feedback um, to the point where I'm at a draft ready to send out, which is never ever the first draft, usually not the third draft either. <laughs> Any, anybody else got anything to add to that? That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Awesome. So we've got uh, a question from uh, a friend of mine. His name is Cody. He would like to know, uh, he can't afford film school, so how can he go? For someone who doesn't have the means to afford film school, what's, what are good resources for them to be able to do? Paul, you didn't go to film school. Correct. Uh, one of the best almost free film, film schools is UCLA Extension. You can do that online as well, so you can do that from anywhere in the world. Another good resource would be the mwp.com library of writers. That's Michael Weesey Productions. They've got uh, books just about anything in terms of how to write, how to direct, how to act, how to make a film, how to finance a film. So they've got a great list of books. I would also go to the WGA library when it opens up again. They've got scripts that you can read and that is the best education there is, is reading scripts. So uh, you can read all the scripts that uh, have been nominated for WGA awards and you can read uh, pilots and you can read all kinds of feature films. Uh, if you wanna read older scripts, you go to the um, Motion Picture Academy's Merrick, uh, what's her name, uh, Herrick Library and read scripts that from the silent era, which are very um, educative because you can see how they describe the stories. And that's sometimes missing in a lot of scripts that we see today. So that's where I would start uh, to get my education and then watch a lot of movies and a lot of Actually, television. Well, we got time for plenty of that these days. That's Michelle? Yeah, I wanted to add, um, for those who don't live in LA and so going to the WGA is not an option, I always encourage my students, first of all, Paul is correct, read every script you get your hand on, but you can read a lot online now. I mean, there's the TV writing Google website, which has all the television scripts for decades. You can even read Hill Street Blues. Um, you can go to Simply, Simply Scripts, you can go to the internet movie script database. You can read pretty much any script online. If you can find it, you just have to Google it and just say, you know, Fast and the Furious script. And you'll find, you're gonna find at least two or three of those out there. Um, and also if you, there is a site, if you can't find like a hard to find script again, and you're not in LA, you can't go to the WGA or to the Academy. There's a site called ScriptFly and you can actually purchase a, a physical copy or they'll, they'll email you a PDF. I, for example, wanted to read Fatal Attraction. And it's important that you read the script versus just watch the movie um, if you wanna be a screenwriter, because you need to see the words on the page and like Paul said, how they put it together. Um, any student that's writing action in any of my classes, they have to read The Fast and the Furious. They have to read um, John, John Wick. They have to read any script they can find that can show them and teach them how to write that specific type of action. Um, but yeah, I can't emphasize that enough. And when it comes, oh, I watched the movie, go find the script. <laughs> and I also, we also in the, in the uh, WGA, we get little scripts during award season and I often share them with my students for educational purposes only, but it's great for them to see the actual script of the movies that have been nominated. Nice. One last quick question uh, for Maria. Uh, Meth, I, I hope I say her name right, Mathmalia from Facebook wants to know, uh, how do I write a script for animation? Is it different from a normal script format? Because you got to work on Dora the Explorer, right? Yeah, yeah. I've got to work on a lot of, uh, actually I have an upcoming show called, uh, it's the Madagascar A Little Wild, which is, uh, yeah, the, the kids, uh, when Madagascar characters were little kids. And so oh. that's coming to Peacock TV. <laughs> really cute, very cute show. Nice. Um, it's not different, really. I mean, there's two, for television, there's two, two different uh, ways to, um, to write for TV. One is board driven, where it's, it's driven by the artists. And so really the writer is writing a, an outline and then the, um, you know, the animators and the director and stuff, they're the ones sort of filling in the dialogue and then the writers can also pitch like, jokes or you know or different pieces of dialogue but 
Um, but that's so that's board driven. But there's also uh, shows that are just script driven, just like anything else that you would write. So it's not really different. Just you just have to, um, you know, why animation is what you always have to ask yourself if you're writing something original. Why is it animation? Why does it have to be? It should there should be a reason for it. You know, they're animals. You know, or they're you know that 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 uh, uh, rides skateboards. You know, or something. So so um, so yeah, it's really not that much different. Nice. Thanks, Maria. All right. Well, that's the time for the questions that we got. Let's hustle into our last segment, the good, the bad, and the shameless. <laughs> and uh, the good is uh, do something good. Suggest a good learning resource for writers, which here in the end, we've done a ton of that. The bad, a common mistake inexperienced writers make. Maybe let's, we've covered enough in formatting. So if you have any other things, let's hear those. And then the shameless, what's a fun thing you like to do when you're suffering from writer's block or you're just sick of being in your house because quarantine. Michelle, let's start with you. Um, again, read scripts. That's the good. Uh, you are good enough. I, I can't emphasize that enough to students and your story is good enough. You don't have to make anything up. Everything you've already been through has prepared you to write the stories that you are to tell. And uh, when I am struggling, I watch Ratchet Reality TV. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh. I love it, the, the fighting and I, I don't know. And it's funny, I've now hooked my husband. He's like embarrassed to, but he watches it with me. <laughs> hey, that's, that's, that's why it's shameless. <laughs> All right, hey Maria, how about you? Good, bad, shameless. Yes, I, um, I, I also, storysense.com has okay. a great like screenplay format guide. I actually give that to, I say, I tell all my students to look at that so that I don't have to say the typical things all the time, like how to write a piece of a, a scene where people are on the phone. Hello, it's there. I don't want to waste the time, you know, teaching to, to, to tell you what that format is. Also, j not just reading, but but I would deconstruct scripts. Like if you do want, if you do want to write a, an action movie like Fast and Furious, well, you know what? Deconstruct it. What's the A storyline? What's the B storyline? What, you know, in take the scene and write it in a in a sentence or two. And the, and for the whole script, you know, do that because that sort of makes you deconstruct it and sort of figure out what what you know what you need in the script. Um, and then the bad, the uh, shameless thing I do, not that much different from Michelle. I watch any dating show there is. <laughs> Blind Date, Love Island, those are my favorite. <laughs> those things get me because I've never been on any dates like that. I'm just like, who <laughs> dates like this? <laughs> ah, makes me really happy to be married. Um, I said that because the wife's right over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Uh, we're going to keep on going and trying to wrap things up, but I just want to give a heads up. Michelle, Maria, I know if you got to bounce out, no shame. I love you both. Thank you so much for being here. Otherwise, we got two more uh, good, bad, and shamelesses. Paul, let's go to you. Well, the good, uh, I've already mentioned that. It's, that's the WGA library and MWP. Uh, the bad would be new screenwriters tend to forget conflict in every scene. They really need conflict, and they also don't consider proofreading an important part of writing, and it really is. Uh, it's like you, you wouldn't buy a scratched up car, so why would you buy a typoed manuscript? You're just not going to do it. Uh, the shameless, um, I like to go out in the afternoon and play catch with my dog. So I throw the ball, she brings it back. I throw the ball, she brings it back. I throw it nice. farther, she brings it back. <laughs> we both relax. Nice, nice. Thank you. And Amy, take us home. What's your good? What's your bad? What's your shameless? Um, I would say the good is, depending on your background, um, try to expose yourself to an element of the process, the filmmaking process that you're you're not as familiar with. So if you come from like a creative writing background, like take an acting class, take a directing class, or be on a set. Um, if you come from an acting background, like try to you know, inform yourself about directing, like all, all the elements can really feed each other. Um, as far as the mistake, um, I agree the best way to learn is reading scripts, but what I see a lot with first time writers is that then they don't give themselves permission to write messy drafts. They think that the first 
thing that comes out of their head should look like this polished script that was probably somebody's draft like 27. So <laughs> just know that those scripts you read are not first drafts and remember that. Um, and shameless, well, I have um, a 10 year old and a seven year old. And so we're getting through this by Harry Potter all the time. <laughs> we watch the books, we read the books. It's just Harry Potter all the time at my house. So. Nice. Good times. All right, guys. Well, let me just do a few quick shout outs. I want to say thank you. Uh, this week, I was on a podcast by um, called The Pulse, which is by AMI out of Canada. They uh, Joita Gupta had me on to talk about this show, Scene to Screen. So uh, you can find that on my Facebook and Twitter and all that sort of stuff. I want to say thank you to Joita. I want to say thank you to Alan Rucker from the Media Access Awards, Nick Novicki from the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. David Zimmerman from Performing Arts Studio West and our panel one more time, Michelle Amore, Maria Escobedo, I'm sorry, Maria, Maria Escobedo, Paul uh, Chitlick, and Amy Fox. Thank you guys all. I appreciate you being Thank here. You Thank you for your Thank time. You. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. And we'll take care. All right. Bye. 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 Have a good day, everyone. Bye.